In this video, we'll be covering Rule 16, which will go through the relief options for abnormal course conditions, which now in the 2019 Rules of Golf includes immovable obstructions. And we'll also go through options for relief when a golf ball is embedded. So we'll, we'll go through the purpose statement, why this rule was created. We'll talk about abnormal course conditions and go through a few definitions. And then finally, we'll wrap things up with talking about embedded ball. So this presentation will go into detail on the four types of abnormal course conditions. We'll talk about relief procedure from each of those and we'll go over the term nearest point of complete relief. And then we'll go through relief from an embedded ball, specifically in the general area. So the purpose of Rule 16 is to cover when and how the player can take relief by playing a ball from a different place than where their ball lies. And this can come up if they have interference from an abnormal course condition, or it could be a situation where there is a dangerous animal condition. Uh, luckily in Iowa, we don't have to worry about that too much, but there are cases where maybe you have something like um, bees or wasps in a bunker. So just know that type of situation is, co is covered under Rule 16. We won't go into it in detail in this presentation, but just know this is where you can go to look, look that rule up if that situation comes up. So the reason we get relief from these uh, abnormal course conditions is that they're not treated as part of the normal challenge of playing the course. And that's why we get free relief everywhere except for penalty areas. The way that a golfer takes relief is they drop a ball in the relief area based on that nearest point of complete relief. The rule also covers relief from that embedded ball in its own pitch mark, specifically in the general area. So we'll go through each of these sections. So 16.1 A through F, we'll cover each of these and kind of work through definitions and, and what relief options are in each of these. But to start, we'll just, we'll look at the definition of an abnormal course condition. So what this includes is any of these four conditions. Animal holes, ground under repair, which is usually marked by uh, the committee in charge of the competition. Immovable obstructions, or temporary water. To take a look at the definition of an animal hole, it's any hole that's dug in the ground by an animal, so that kind of makes sense. But the exception is it does not include animals that are also categorized under or defined under loose impediment. So things like worms and insects and spiders, you would be getting relief under the loose impediment rule so they're excluded from this animal hole definition. An animal hole also includes the loose material that's dug out from the hole, so you would get relief from that. You get relief from the tracks that an animal would make leading up to it, and any area of the ground that's been pushed up or altered as a result of the animal digging underground. All right, so to look at the definition of an animal, it's any living member of the animal kingdom other than us, humans. So it includes mammals, birds, reptiles. Uh, it also includes worms, insects, spiders, and things like that. To take a look at the definition of ground under repair, it's any part of the course that has been defined by the committee as ground under repair. So in this picture, it's, it's marked with paint, but in some situations, it's marked in different ways but all the ground inside of the, the edge of the defined area is part of the ground under repair. And that includes any grass, bush, trees, other things that are rooted in the area and extend up and above the ground outside that defined area. 
but it does not include things that are attached to the ground or below the ground outside the edge of that defined area. And this picture gives you a good example of that. So in most cases, this is, this is gonna be a tree root or something like that. So you can see the white line defines ground under repair and the root part outside of that line would not, uh, you would not get free relief in that situation. So the term ground under repair also includes the following things, even if the committee does not define them or mark them in some way. So it includes any hole made by the committee or the maintenance staff. So that could be a hole in the ground from when a stake's removed. Or maybe if there's a hole on a double green, that, that's also a hole made by a maintenance staff. So that would be uh, considered ground under repair even though it's not uh, defined or marked by the committee. Any maintenance that's being done on the course? Uh, in this example, they're, they're probably digging up an irrigation line. So even, even if that's not marked by the committee, a golfer is going to get relief from that. They would also get relief from grass cuttings and leaves if they are piled for removal. Um, and that part is very important. That part's highlighted because if these uh, if this is not intended to be removed from where it's left, then it would not fall under this category, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Any uh, natural material that's piled to be removed, it also is, uh, falls into the category of a loose impediment. But if any of the material is left on the course and it is not intended to be removed, then it does not fall under this category. It does not fall under ground under repair. So an example of this would be maybe in certain areas of the golf course, they take the grass clippings and they spread them in that area just to maybe fill dirt, dirt uh, patches. Um, that, that would not fall under this category because it's not piled for removal. They're intending to keep it there. So the edge of the ground under repair, it should be defined by stakes. Um, should is a, a recommended word, so it doesn't mean it has to, but it should be. And when it is defined by those stakes, so the line between the outside points of the stake at ground level define that edge. So the stakes themselves are considered in the ground under repair. If a line's used, that makes it really easy. It's the edge, uh, the outside edge of the line is considered the part that defines ground under repair. So the line itself is considered in the ground under repair. And then if you have a case where a physical feature is defining the edge, so maybe there's um, a plastic edge piece that's defining what's ground under repair, uh, the committee should, should write that in there their local rules or conditions of competition to notify the golfers that that's what's being used to define uh, ground under repair in that case. So now we'll talk about immovable obstructions. And that is any obstruction, obviously, that cannot be moved. But it means that it can't be moved without unreasonable effort or without damaging it. So an item could be immovable for one person, say a small child can't lift something, but an adult, maybe that object is movable. So it all depends on the, uh, how reasonable it is for that golfer in that situation to, to move that object. The committee has the ability to define any object to be immovable if they don't want golfers to you know, move any part of it. So. Maybe this fence here that you see in the picture is, maybe it's a historic site and they don't want golfers to be moving the pieces of this fence uh, out of the way. So the committee can decide to define that fence as an immovable obstruction to kind of keep golfers from, from interfering with it if they want. All right, so we uh, kind of went through the definition of, of some of these things. So now we'll just take a little deeper look at getting relief from all of these situations. 
This rule does not give relief for boundary objects or integral objects. They are not considered, they do not fall under the definition of a immovable obstruction. They're kind of their own thing and they're fixed objects, so the golfer would not get relief from those things, boundary objects or integral objects. So a boundary object is anything that defines that edge and it can include walls, fences, stakes. I'm sure all of you have seen these things. But the main thing is that free relief is not allowed from boundary object objects. They're treated as immovable. So that means a golfer can't, if there's a white stake, they're not going to be able to move that object. They are considered fixed. So they also don't fall under either of those definitions. They're not considered an obstruction and they're not considered an integral object. They're their own thing. So an integral object is an artificial object that's been defined as the by the committee as part of the challenge of playing the golf course. So they don't give the golfer free relief from these things. So uh, in the picture above you have a you know a stone stone wall that's inside a penalty area. So they're considering, considering that an integral part. Uh, the one on the bottom is, is a wire running up a tree. But again, it's something that the committee has put into writing and you would know if, an, if there's an integral object on the golf course. Uh, as I mentioned before, they're, they're treated as immovable. So now we'll, we'll start talking about when relief is allowed for these different things. But first, before we, before we get into that, we're going to talk about nearest point of complete relief. This is a pretty, pretty useful and important term to know. So the nearest point of complete relief is the reference point for taking relief from all of these things. Those abnormal conditions that we just talked about, dangerous animal conditions, uh, you use this when you're taking relief from a wrong putting green or no play zones or if there are certain local rules in place. So what this is, is it's the estimated point where the ball lies that is nearest to where the original spot was, but not near the hole. So in this picture, you can see that the golfers, uh, they ended up in, a, in the middle of this cart path here. So they are deciding which side left or right of where the ball lies moves the golf ball the least. So we can see here this graphic, make, graphic makes it very easy that this golfer's nearest point would be to the left because the golf ball is moving the least distance. It's moving four feet compared to six. It has to be in the required area of the golf course. So if this is in the general area, that's where they're going to take relief. And where the condition does not interfere with the stroke the player would have made from the original spot if the condition was not there. So in this case, if this golfer would be playing a, let's say an eight iron from this distance, that's really the club that they should be using when deciding where this nearest point is. So as I, as I just said, you estimate this reference point by identifying uh, the point with uh, the club stance swing and line of play that the player would have used when making this stroke. So the nearest point of complete relief relates solely to the particular condition from which the relief is being taken. So that means all we're de dealing with here in this picture is relief from this cart path. Um, it doesn't say that the nearest point of relief is the, the nicest spot. Um, in some cases, it might be a better decision to just play the golf ball where, where it lies. For example, in this picture, this gentleman's nearest point of complete relief, where he's not standing on the cart path, actually puts him under this tree in the mulch. So it might be better in this case to play the golf ball where it lies. So if the player takes relief, then has interference by another condition, which they're allowed to take relief from. The player is allowed to take relief again by determining a new point of complete relief from that condition. 
but each one must be taken separately. So an example of this would be, say, say a golfer ends up on a cart path and their nearest point of complete relief puts them in an area of temporary water. So those are two separate conditions. So the golfer has to first take relief from the cart path, they would drop, and then they have the option to then take relief from the temporary water if they wish, but they have to do both as separate actions. The only exception to this, where the golfer can take relief from both conditions at the same time, is when they've already taken relief separately from each condition and they can come to the conclusion after doing both that if they can continue to do it, they're just gonna keep going back and forth, back and forth between the two um, areas that they get relief from. So if that is the case, then they're able to take relief from both, but only after they've done um, taken relief from each one separately. So the meaning of interference by an abnormal course condition is if the player's ball touches or is in or on an abnormal course condition, or if the abnormal course condition interferes with the player's area of intended stance or intended swing. So this power box in this case, uh, they're fine with their stance and their their uh, lie, but in your area of intended swing, um, they have interference there. And only when a golf ball is on the putting green in an abnormal course condition uh, interferes, do they get relief from line of play. So the golf ball has to be on the putting green for a golfer to get relief from line of play. So in this case, a sprinkler head. If you have a situation where the abnormal course condition is close and maybe it's a, a distraction to the player but it doesn't actually interfere, then this golfer would not get relief in this case from that, from that um, course condition. So, so this golfer, even if that is distracting to have that sprinkler head there, it doesn't actually affect any of those um, any of those situations surrounding the swing, so they would not get relief in this case. So relief is allowed anywhere on the golf course, except for one place, and that's in a penalty area. So a golfer gets relief from interference by these things only if the abnormal course condition is on the course and the ball is anywhere on the course except in a penalty area. If the golf ball is in that penalty area, this, this golfer would not get relief from that um, railing that's affecting her swing. Another situation that you have to keep in mind is that a golfer does not get relief when it's unreasonable to play the golf ball. This can kind of be a tough call to make as a rules official, but uh, you have to decide if the golfer didn't have interference from an abnormal course condition. So say for example, there's ground under repair right next to this, the bottom picture, this um, area where there's rock, and the golf ball ends up in a, in a spot where the, the golfer would not have been able to hit that golf ball anyway, they're not just gonna get a get a get out of jail free card in this case. Uh, they would not be granted relief because the ball, it's just not reasonable that they actually would have been able to, to hit that shot if that interference wasn't there. Another situation is if the only way that the golfer is having interference is that they choose to play a shot in a way that they typically wouldn't or that was unnecessary for that shot, then that would also fall under being unreasonable and the golfer would not get relief in that case. So uh, this gentleman, as he prepares to make this shot, he takes his stance normally. Uh, there are, there's no issues with that drain 
but then he decides to you know pull his his foot backwards and stand on it so that he can try to get a you know maybe he has a bad lie in the rough he wants to see if he can get a little better lie uh, he would not be granted relief in that case because if he takes a normal stance he has no issues he's he's doing something unreasonable to make it make it happen so relief in the general area if the player's ball is in the general area and has interference by an abnormal course condition, the player can take relief by dropping the ball or another ball. They can substitute one in this case. And what they use is they, the reference point is that nearest point of complete relief in the general area. The size of the relief area is one club length. But it is limited to these things. It must be in the general area, because that's where it originally was. It can't be near the hole, then the reference point. And there must be complete relief from the interference. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, and this happens a lot in, the sp in spring golf when we have a lot of rain and, and there are wet conditions, if a golfer has interference from temporary water, they have to take complete relief meaning that um, in, some, in some situations it might take them into a condition that they don't want to play from, maybe in the rough or in the trees. So it's always a good idea to, to be knowledgeable of this and to let the players, let your players know or your golfers to just keep in mind before you pick the golf ball up to take relief, take a look around and, and see where you're going to end up. It might be a better decision to just play it where it's at. So taking relief from a ball in a bunker, if it's in the bunker and they have interference, they have two options of taking relief. They can take free relief, but there's some restrictions of where they can drop the golf ball, or they can take penalty relief if they want to get out of the bunker. So free relief in this case falls under the same um, principles as general, general area except that the ball must stay in the bunker and the complete relief must be remain in the bunker. In some situations, especially for temporary water in a bunker, there, there might be cases where there isn't a nearest point of complete relief, meaning there isn't a spot where they're not gonna have interference from water. So they can still take relief but what, what they have to do is they might have to use a point of maximum available relief in the bunker. So point of maximum available relief as a definition is a reference point for taking relief in a bunker or on a putting green when there is no nearest point of complete relief, meaning they, they can't get all the way out of the, the interference. So they, it's an estimated point where the ball should lie it's nearest to where the ball's original spot was, not near the hole. Has to be in the required area of the course. So in this example, we're using a bunker, so it would have to stay in there. And it's where that abnormal course condition has the least interference. So the point of maximum available relief is found by comparing the amount of interference with uh, the line of play, but that's only specifically on the putting green that you're looking at line of play. So for example, when you're taking relief from temporary water, that maximum available relief point might be where the ball is in shallower water than where your stance is. On the putting green specifically, that's where we're considering the line of play. That's that only situation where we can do that. So in that case, it might be where the ball has to go through the shallowest water or the, sh the shortest length of it. So this picture does a, a nice job of giving that example. So you can see the original line, uh, the, area, the amount of water they're having to go through is quite a bit more than the one to the right. So their relief would be uh, that um, yellow shaded area to the right, even though they're still having to putt through water. So for a golf ball in the bunker, there is an additional option for them, but it would cost them a one-stroke penalty. 
they can take relief by dropping the golf ball outside of the bunker and they use the method of back on the line relief. So it's based on that reference line going straight back from the hole through the spot of the original ball. And the point that's selected is chosen by the player. It has to be on that reference line. And the, there is a requirement that it has to be farther from the hole than the original spot. And there's no limit to how far back the golfer can can go in this case as long as it meets that requirement. When the player chooses that refer reference point, they really should indicate it by placing an object such as a T where it is. So the size of the relief area is measured with one club length, but the location of that, that relief area is a little bit limited. It can't be near the hole than the reference point. It can be in any area of the golf course but it can't be in more than one location. And so if you have a situation where a relief area has two areas of the golf course, so in this example you have the general area and a penalty area, if both of those come into play, the ball must come to rest in that relief area in the same area that it the ball first touched when it was dropped there. So in this example, say the golfer wanted to drop in the general area, if that's where it first struck the golf course, then if it then uh, rolls into the section that's penalty area, they would have to redrop in that case. So it has to stay in the area they intended to drop it in or where it first hit. All right, so looking at a golf ball on the putting green, if a player's ball is on the putting green and they have interference from the condition, they can take free relief by placing the original ball or another golf ball. They can substitute one on the spot of, nearest, of the nearest point of complete relief. The nearest point of complete relief must either be on the putting green or in the general area. So in some cases, the, golf, uh, the golfer might have to end up placing the golf ball maybe in the fringe. So in this case, there's interference from temporary water. They might have to move the golf ball to the side, taking them off the putting green, but that's okay in this case. And as we talked about before with maximum available relief, if there is no point of complete relief, then they have to use that maximum available relief reference point. And in that case, it can either be on the putting green or in the general area. So sometimes you have a situation where you can't actually find the golf ball in the abnormal course condition. In this example, they show a shed, but in a lot of cases, it ends up being where the golf ball ended up in an area of marked ground under repair or maybe a really big area of temporary water. Um, so. If the player's golf ball has not been found, but it's known or virtually certain that the ball has come to rest or in or on that abnormal course condition, then they still get relief in that case. We just have to kind of change what we're using as the, um, the reference point. So they use the estimated point where the ball last crossed the edge. So we're, we're using that small wooden bu building in this example and they use that as the spot of where um, as the spot of the ball for the purpose of finding nearest point of of complete relief so they're going to use that edge the point where it last crossed to then determine where their nearest point of complete relief is so there we're determining the spot where it last crossed we're going to find the nearest point and drop it there. So once the player puts another ball into play and taking relief, the original ball is no longer in play and should not be played. And that is true even if the original ball is then found on the golf course before the end of the three-minute search um, is completed. 
if you have a situation where you're really not certain if the golf ball came to rest in that abnormal course condition, then the player has to proceed under uh, lost ball. They can't just assume that it's in there if they don't have virtual certainty. So they have to use stroke and distance in that case. All right, so in 16.1F, we're going to be talking about no play zones. All right, so now we'll, we'll cover no play zones, which is uh, mandatory relief. So in each of these situations, the golfer cannot play the ball as it lies. So when the ball is in a no play zone or when a no play zone interferes with um, anything related to the swing. So if a golfer is in a no play zone, if it is in the general area, they have to take relief using the 16.1B, which we went through earlier. They have to use that, to that method to take relief. If that no play zone is in a bunker, the player can take free relief or penalty, penalty relief, which we went through, so they have two options there. But the important part is that they must in a no play zone. Or if that no play zone is on the putting green, they have to take free relief using those options under uh, 16.1D. So when a no play zone interferes with stance or swing for a ball anywhere on the course except for the penalty area, uh, the golfer must take relief from the no play zone if it, if it interferes with those things, even if the golf ball is outside of that, of that uh, no play zone. They take relief under those options we talked about, and that all depends on um, where, the, where the golf ball is located. Is it in the general area, bunker, or putting green? You proceed in that, that way, um, but they, they must take relief if it interferes with those things because they're trying to protect that area. That's the intent of these no-play zones. Or the, gol the golfer also has the option to take an unplayable ball uh, relief in this situation um, as an additional option. Okay, so to talk about 16.3, which is embedded ball, uh, we'll talk about when relief is allowed. So the ball uh, first must be embedded in the general area, and then we have to determine whether the ball is embedded to know if we get relief. So the definition of an embedded ball is when a player's ball is in its own pitch mark, mark made as a result of the player's previous stroke, so that part's important, and then second, where part of the golf ball is below the level of the ground. Uh, that doesn't mean that you have to, that doesn't mean that you have to see dirt under the golf ball. It could be that there, there's grass between, but the important part is that it, part of the golf ball is below the level of the ground. So you can see that in this second picture. Uh, you can still see grass, but it's clearly made an indentation which is below the level of the ground. So the ball must be embedded in that general area to get relief. There's no relief under this rule if the ball is embedded anywhere except for that general area. And exceptions for this would be when the ball is embedded in sand in a part of the general area that's not cut to fairway height or less, or when interference by anything other than the ball being embedded makes it clearly unreasonable. So those are two cases where the golfer would not get relief in this case, even if the ball is technically in the general area. Um, because as we talked about earlier, in this case, that golf ball is, is embedded under a, a dead tree. I think it's pretty unreasonable to say that this golfer would have been able to play that shot um, had it not been embedded. So to determine it, the only way that the golf ball is embedded is if it's in its own pitch mark made as a result of the pe previous stroke. And as I said, as part of the ball has to be below the surface of the ground. 
And if you have a situation where the player can't tell for sure if the ball's embedded in its own pitch mark or, or a pitch mark made by another player, um, you can go ahead and, and allow the player to you know, treat the ball as embedded if it's reasonable to, to kind of conclude that, yeah, it's, it's very possible that this is from the golfer's own pitch mark in that case. A situation where a golf ball would not be embedded would be uh, if it is below the level of the ground as a result of something other than the previous stroke that was made. So examples of this would be the ball is pushed in the ground because someone accidentally stepped on it. Or maybe it's a case where the golfer takes a swing and, and the ball never becomes airborne, so it's just hit further into the ground. That is not considered embedded because it, it uh, was never airborne. Or another case is if the ball was dropped in taking relief under a roll. So it has to be from a previous stroke. So when taking relief from an embedded ball in the general area, the player uh, has relief options where they can drop the original ball or another ball so they can substitute one. The reference point is the spot right behind where the golf ball was embedded, so you can see that in this diagram. The size of the relief area is one club length, but it is limited to uh, not being near the hole than the reference point, but it also has to be dropped in the general area. So again, here's a situation where part of a, a penalty area is crossing into this uh, relief area that would be excluded from where the golf ball could end up. All right, so that's it for Rule 16 for abnormal course conditions and embedded ball. Uh, if you have any questions at any time on this topic, please reach out to our office. We're always happy to help um, kind of guide you through some of these rules or making decisions on these things. And we appreciate you taking the time to, to learn about these before the golf season.